Hello. Today we're going to look at five different small video cassette formats that were primarily used with camcorders or small portable recorders. Now it's funny that the uh, one format people tend to remember most is VHS-C because you could put these into an adapter and play them on a VHS machine. But actually the VHS-C format was nowhere near as popular as the more successful 8mm cassettes. And Sometimes still people get hopelessly confused and believe there are all kinds of magic adapters that could allow you to play any kind of tape in a VHS machine, which is of course complete nonsense. Later, from the 1990s, all the analog video cassette formats were obsoleted by digital tape formats, primarily mini-DV, though Digital 8 was popular for quite some time, and there was also the diminutive but unsuccessful micro-MV format. We're going to briefly look at all of these, plus an earlier format called CVC. This video cassette's unusual. This is not, strictly speaking, a camcorder cassette because no camcorders were made for this format. Rather, it was used in portable machines um, and also uh, in nice little video players. And I've shown one of those in a previous video. Um, you can see some here. Now, the interesting thing about this format, apart from the fact it failed horribly, is that it works more like a, an audio cassette. Take a look here. This cassette is near the end. So the tape starts here and winds its way to the take-up spool. And you can see that the space vacated by the supply spool is taken up by the take-up spool, just like it did on an old-fashioned audio cassette. And it's almost unique in video cassettes in having that uh, arrangement. The other format that would do it would be Umatic. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure of any other formats that do this. So, let's have a look in this uh, quite unusual video cassette. Just four screws, hold this one together. If we open the lid just before we take it apart, there's a little push button here which releases the lid. You can see underneath the tape there's a support from a plastic um, I don't know what you'd call that, plastic support, should we say. Which is similar, actually, to Umatic. has a similar sort of arrangement. Right, let's carefully take the top off and see what we have. Immediately I can find myself when springs twinging away. So there's a spring here, which is used for closing the front door. In the top of the cassette here, and it's stuck in this particular occasion to the top part, is a glider sheet, just as found on most good quality audio cassettes. I'm not saying all audio cassettes have this, but the glider sheet helps the tape to rotate and move without scraping against hard plastic, which can damage the edges of the tape, and keeps the, the whole tape um, running more smoothly. So similarly, there will be a glider sheet underneath the spools. So looking at the tape path, it goes through a guide here. There's a plastic uh, guide there. You can see the small, there's a small plastic um, retainer there which pushes on the tape, holds the tape against that metal guide, goes through the front, like I said that's the plastic guide we saw earlier, and then on the take-up spool, do we have a plastic guide there as well, or is it just on the one side? best way to find out is to take the spool out, isn't it? Let's do that. Now, unlike other video cassettes, we must be very careful because these tapes are unsupported. There's no flanges on the hubs. So there's nothing to stop the tape from just spilling out and landing all over the place. Yes, there is a small plastic guide pushing it against the 
nylon roller here. What an unusual arrangement then. We have the bottom part of the hubs is free. It's not connected to the top part of the hubs. And this is, uh, I believe, part of the braking mechanism. There's um, teeth here, which align with notches on the bottom of here. So the braking mechanism is designed such that the spools normally sit down on the cassette. I believe they're pushed by springs. Yes, there we go. There are springs on the top of the cassette here. They push down on the, these and so guarantee that the bottom of these hubs are not free to rotate but are braked. So when the cassette is in your pocket or something, the spools won't rotate. What a nice idea. So they don't have uh, a mechanism to release those brakes in the way that, say, uh, a VHS tape does, which involves a pin going up from the cassette deck and then releasing a brake on the spools. These are released by the fact that the cassette goes down and then the spools inside the machine lift these off the brakes. Quite a cool idea, that. So, what would we do if we wanted to splice this kind of tape? Well, I believe it's approximately a quarter inch. So let's try an editing block from a quarter inch audio. Now this isn't really designed for this kind of tape, but uh, I think it'll give us a good shot. Does the tape sit neatly in the bottom of this quarter inch audio splicing block? Yes, yes, actually that's really nice. That's quite rigid in there, so we'd have no problem at all getting our blade to cut the tape and splice it as necessary. I'm not going to destroy this particular tape, I don't have any reason to, but you can see that that would be quite easy to cut and re-splice as necessary. Let's see if we can reassemble this tape. I can tell this is going to be a little fiddlier than some. So we need the tape to go between the guide and this plastic, I don't know what we're going to call it, tensioner or what have you. There we go. That's good. That's nice. And the same on the other side. Place the top back on. Ah, I have a problem. I can see something's not quite right about that spring there, so we'll uh, take that off and just get that spring snuggled into its proper position. Yes. Yes, we have that. Good. So 
So whilst this format was something of a flop, the cassettes themselves are quite a nice design. Really ingenious the way they've arranged it so that uh, it gives as much possible space for the tape as they could have got in such a small shell. Not bad that. That's the CVC format from Technicolor Funai that was um, not particularly popular from roughly 1981 to 1983, thereabouts. This is an example of a VHSC cassette. Now, I'll try to be as polite as I can about the VHSC format. It um, possibly wasn't the best. This particular one has come from a customer in this state so it's going to need some repair. As it happens, this particular one, it looks like I could repair it without dismantling the cassette, but I'm going to just to show you how the cassette is built. We'll start with the screws. Now, sometimes they mix different types of screws in here, and the screws have an extremely long thread on them. They're not so much done up as rammed in, so they can be difficult or impossible to extract. Let's have a go. That one's okay, that's a proper screw, I'm okay with that one. Good. Right, different type of screw. Okay, this doesn't appear to be one of the really awful tapes where they have very, very long screws on them. It's coming apart relatively easily. So I've undone those screws, but they've not popped out yet. Got one more still stuck in there. Okay, that's just going to stay there. There are clips to release as well, similar to the clips you get on V2000 tapes. You can tell that this format was not so much designed from the ground up as bodged on to the VHS format later. It it's, um, feels bodged. Okay. You can get into trouble with these guides. One of the guides stayed at the bottom and one of them went up with the tape. There we go. Now what's a uh, little unusual about this format, or the cassette, is that normally you only have guides on the inside here where the tape touches. But this format, the tape, there's also a guide on the outside and that's because when it's in the VHSC adapter cassette thing, the tape is pulled this way by these arms so on this side and you see here as well the uh, tape needs guides on both sides now the braking mechanism is um, <laughs> limited there's only really a brake on the take up spool so the supply spool can slop about to some extent. There's not really a proper braking mechanism on there. The supply spool, uh, the take-up spool's um, braking mechanism consists of this spring on the top and then a plastic component underneath. And you really have to take that out in order to pull this spool out. And we do have one of the plastic components there that rides along the tape as per VHS and beta tapes. So now we have the two spools out. Let's take these parts out of the way so I don't lose them.
I'm going to splice this damaged section of tape out of here. Use my uh, half inch tape splicing block. I could have used a 90 degree angle here, but I've chosen this slight incline angle. Just cosmetic really, for what I'm doing. Let's get rid of the worst of these chewed up components. And we see actually, that on this particular case, the tape is damaged right at the very start. I could actually splice that onto the leader tape. Shall I do that? Yes, I think I will. In that case, I will go for a 90 degree cut. So we lost a few seconds from the beginning of that tape, but it's not very much. And it was mostly unplayable anyway. Splicing tape. This joint should never go past the heads anyway, but even if it does, that won't damage anything. Reasonably high quality join. So this can be now loaded back into the shell. touching the tape to a minimum. There may be a train of thought, a school of thought that you should handle tapes with gloves, but in practice that just makes life too hard. Now put the braking mechanism back on. Making sure the tape isn't crumpled at the front. That's all good. If this cover breaks off, it's actually not the end of the world. It will still play. So the front cover matters a lot more on some other formats, but on this format, if it's not there, it won't stop any machine I've come across from playing it. Two small screws. Definitely not the worst VHSC tape I've come across. Some have very long screws here with a very coarse thread on them. And they are pretty much rammed in. They're not really screwed in. And sometimes they can't be extracted. And the only way to repair the cassette is to break it physically apart and mount the tape into another cassette shell. Good. So we could load that now into the VHSC adapter shell. And I'll open this so you can see what it does. If you've never seen this before. You close it and then 
these arms come out and turn it into what appears to be a VHS tape as far as the machine is concerned. They are, however, when you rewind this, extremely noisy and you'll hear that every time you've ever heard a VHS C tape rewind and all these things, it rattles awful. What do you think of that camcorder, Alex? It's horrible. From the late 1980s through to the early 2000s, the most popular format of uh, video cassette for camcorders was 8mm. Now, there are three types here. We have the standard Video 8 cassette. That was followed later by Hi8. This was extremely popular with um, semi-professionals and prosumers, people who wanted more resolution than a standard video 8 tape would give you and later again digital 8 which used the codec from mini dv tapes and it was effectively a mixture of mini dv and 8 millimeter now i also have here a cleaning cassette which will do any of those three variants and here we have a hi8 camcorder This is one of the slightly later models. It will also accept Video 8 tapes and can make Video 8 recordings. Later Digital 8 camcorders, and I have some of those, will also accept all three types of tape, but they will only make digital recordings. Most, but not all, Digital 8 camcorders can also play analog recordings and I'll provide you with a link of where you can see which models do support the analog playback. It's a very good format. Um, I think it would be widely agreed that it was superior to the competing VHS-C format but there can be some small issues. Uh, one in particular can be mould. If these tapes are stored badly they can develop white flecks, you can see white flecks on the spools, these tapes are in good condition but you can get them and I've found for some reason Fuji branded tapes are particularly prone to mould problems. The tape is very thin, that's fine, it works fine but if you get mould, unlike with a thicker tape used in say a VHS shell, the mould won't peel off as the tape progresses through it will glue the tape together and cause it to snap and it snaps in a very distinctive way if you get a mold patch on the top say the snap will be a long tear that goes along um, quite a few centimeters can even be quite a, a long length maybe um, 10 or 20 centimeters before the tear reaches through to the other side and eventually snaps the tape completely now if you have other problems with these and have to dismantle a cassette or if you have to splice it because of a mold problem, I'll show you how to take one of these tapes apart and how to get it together again. And it should be noticed that uh, some manufacturers tapes are a little bit harder to reassemble than others. Even though they're all the same kind of cassette, this mechanism here that opens the door, the spring return for that can be a bit fiddly to put back on some variants of these tapes. So, let's open it up and have a look inside. Five screws. This is the one in the middle, just below the optical sensor position. Let's tip the screws out. I'm holding the cassette together so we don't lose anything. All five screws are out safely. Right, here's what you do. Pull your finger on there so you can open the lid. Carefully lift the top off. Put this down for later on. Now, Here is where things can get tricky. There's more than one type of spring arrangement there, and one of them includes 
uh, a very small uh, metal spring which pings off and is really hard to find and put back correctly. I don't remember if this particular cassette is that type or not. So I'm going to play safe and not fiddle with that. And here you can see the underside of the lid. What I have known to happen is for these little pins here to lose their alignment with the slots that they slide in. And if that happens, the front door mechanism goes all wonky and won't close properly. And you can often fix it, actually, while the tape's still assembled, by opening it and carefully nudging these back into the slots there. Let's have a look at the spools. Now then, if we have a situation where this tape is snapped and we need to splice it, we ideally would like to use a cutting block Here we have an 8mm block. These, however, certainly the metal ones, are very hard to obtain, especially in the UK. And I had this one imported from America. Now, the intention is that the tape will sit in that guide at the bottom. There's a curvature to that and it should just sit in there. To be honest, this trick works better with the larger format tapes like VHS and Beta. But um, that may be down to the thickness of the tape. But it's sat down in there so I can now use a blade to cut the tape and splice it if I need to. Let's do that just to show you. You wouldn't normally cut a tape unless it's been damaged. This is certainly not the way you do edits, for example, like you might have done with audio tapes. So there we have the two ends. And now to make this tape playable again, I bring them together. I prefer to bring them off the, um, the cutting position there. So they should be a very good join. You will get some disturbance in the picture. But usually, of course, when you're doing a splice, you're cutting out some bad tape anyway. Here I have some splicing tape. So this is not tape. This is tape that's specifically designed for use with videotapes. I've made a small tab of tape here that I can place neatly in there. So I don't mind having a small amount of tape either side of the join here which is not supported. That's better than any risk of having your sticky tape going over the edges and potentially touching your video heads uh, or anything else in the tape path. So that's a fairly high quality splice. That will run through the machine with a minimum of disturbance and no chance of damage. Now of course if you don't have such a block you're going to have a harder job making such a high quality alignment as that. You can do it just on a cutting mat like this by lining the edges up. It's a little fiddly but you know if you don't have the equipment you don't have a lot of choice. So I'll uh, carefully put my uh, 8mm splicing block away. Now, 8mm tapes don't have um, any brushes. There's a kind of a brush arrangement consisting of a piece of flexible plastic 
um, on VHS and Beta and VHS-C and various other formats. They don't, but they do have a break lock here, so you need to make sure the spool sits in there. So the tape only goes over these smooth plastic guides and nothing else. Try not to get the tape involved in this door release mechanism here, or you'll regret it. Right. When you can do that, that's nice. I find it best to open this carefully and then place that back onto the lower part of the shell. If you've done it right, you won't be able to open that now because it's locked by the spring-loaded operation here. So slide that and it opens. Honestly, it will. Of course, I don't have the screws in at the moment. There we go. And release it, and it will click shut. Perfect. Tell you what can be a little frustrating if you don't watch what you're doing. When you're refitting these screws, you need to be a bit careful exactly where they go. So you have one here near the optical sensor hole. The front ones are fairly obvious. They go up there. You really don't want to drop the screws down these um, holes here, which are told, which are there to tell the uh, the deck what kind of tape it is and whether it's allowed to record on it. So be a bit careful that you put them back in the screw holes. Not in some of these other holes. Otherwise, you'll drop the screw into the mechanism potentially and have to start again. When you've finished, make sure that the record enable disable function works. This one's set so that you can record at the moment and you can usually pull them across with your finger. Other brands of tape can be fiddlier. There's some where this is really quite hard to do and you need a screwdriver to move that. So that tape will now work fine in, in the camera. Rewind please. Thank you, Max. A green. Yeah, it's going right. Well done, Max. Thank you. <laughs> it's good. Next, let's look at Mini DV. Now, ever wondered why it's called Mini DV? It's because, as well as the small size familiar tapes, there is actually a large version called DV. This particular variant is DV Cam, which can be used in certain video recorders like the one I have here. But today we'll just look at the mini DV size tape because that's what you typically find in camcorders. There were a couple of other sizes actually used for professional equipment on DVC Pro. Here we have a head cleaner tape, always very useful if you uh, find you get uh, stripes or blockiness on your tapes. Now before I take this one apart, I'll show you one that I can't take apart. This Maxell branded tape looks like it has screws, but it's not, it's glued together. So if you have one of those, the only chance of repairing it is to smash up the tape and take the spools out and mount it in a decent quality shell. Right, let's uh, dismantle this better quality cassette. Four screw construction, very similar to Video 8. Okay, as ever, it's best to open the cassette front before taking the top off. So it's a simple construction again, like Video 8, where the tape just runs over these smooth guides at the top and there's nothing else to it. Um, here is the brake arrangement, so a pin at the bottom goes in there and operates the brake release. So a bit of care when taking spools off. OK, let's take the spools off and we'll do a splice to show that we can. Now. It's quarter inch tape, so we can use a normal quarter inch audio splicing block. Like this one.
So we'll do a cut. And then of course you would remove any defective scrunched up tape and then splice it back together using a little video tape splicing tape. Here we have some a small tab of splicing tape that I've cut off the spool. Press it on firmly. That's a good quality join. And of course making sure, as ever, that the splicing tape is on the un scanned part of the tape. The tape is away from the heads. Let's reassemble the shell. As with video 8, there's the same sort of arrangement here with this top cover. And it's important that the two plastic pins sticking out the um, sides here of the shutter engage with the slots in the front of the cassette. And the best way to do that is to make sure you hold it open neatly when you put the top on. And that's correct. If this goes all wonky when you try to open it or jams, you've almost certainly not got the this this cover here sat properly in those guides. And we can refit those screws and that will be fine to play. It should be mentioned that normally these recordings are standard definition, but there is a high definition variant called HDV, and within that there are several sub-variants of different resolutions. And you can see a machine here which uh, accepts many of those uh, high definition uh, HDV recording formats. Now, believe it or not, this is a video cassette. That's the smallest video cassette ever made. I'm sure no other video cassette will ever be made smaller than that. It's called Micro MV from Sony. It was around from 2001 for a few years before Sony canned it. It wasn't a great success. It was supposed to be like a smaller version of Mini DV. But when you look at the size of a, a Micro MV camcorder, sweet and small though it is, it's not massively smaller than a mini DV camcorder. It doesn't make a compelling case for a new format. And there's something else. Mini DV records uh, in a very high quality, low compression DV format. 
this records in a much higher compression MPEG-2 and it makes editing a lot harder. If you were to extract the digital data from this uh, socket which looks like a firewire socket, well it's not. It's the same physical layout but the output signal is MPEG-2. Very little software could handle it. You could get all kinds of problems with sound, lip sync, sound disappearing altogether. It wasn't an ideal format for editing. In fact, when customers ask me to transfer these tapes, I invariably uh, take analog signals out, S video analog signals, and digitize them because then you can get a low compression file format which is better for editing software. But the tapes themselves are very sweet. Let's have a little look at the machine. The user interface could have been a bit better. It looks like it should be touch screen, but it's not. There's a kind of rocker menu thing here, but it's easy enough to work with remote control. Well, it works quite well. Let's eject that tiny little tape. Actually, I found these machines to be fairly robust and reliable. Despite their incredibly small size, they do seem to be quite well built. When you put the tape in, it tells you on the screen when it's recorded and how much of the tape was consumed. There's the recording times and dates and how much of the tape was used. Now, just for comparison, let's have a look at a micro MV tape compared to a slightly larger video cassette. That's stunning, isn't it? Okay, that's an hour and that's a bit over an hour and a half. That's standard definition and that's high definition and it's broadcast quality high definition. But even so, both of these tapes are Sony digital video cassettes and uh, the size difference is just amazing. This screwdriver really is a bit too big for the job. The screws are really tiny. Time for a smaller screwdriver. The smaller screwdriver here is not cross point. most cassette formats it's best to open the front door before you take the lid off. Have I missed a screw? One, two, three, four. I believe that's all that's in here. There we go. There's the top. And really, that is absolutely tiny. Let's zoom in so you can see it in a bit more detail. It's 
So we have a brake mechanism here, and the tape goes around just smooth guides in the same way as uh, an 8mm tape does. So what to do if you have to splice one of these? Well, heaven forbid you do. The cassette width, tape width, is the same as on compact cassette. So this splicing block here, which is a very old thing I had as a teenager, will do for this kind of cassette tape. Um, however, my normal splicing tape here was really intended for use with the VHS or Beta. And it's a little bit too thick. So though you can use it to splice this very thin tape, and it will be a good repair, it probably won't run through the video heads. It's, it will cause a stiff section of tape as it runs through and the deck will shut down. So I've found that if I have to splice one of these I can run up to the join, the camcorder will then stop. I, with the tape reassembled, will release this brake, wind the tape spool on um, a few centimetres, put the cassette back in and then play from that point onwards. Right. Let's try to reassemble this miniature tape. Perfect. That tape should now be good to go. Scott, could you just pass me the tape from that little camcorder, please? Okay. Tiny. It should also be noted that there were also mini DVD camcorders for a while. There were a myriad of formats and subformats within mini DV which caused all kinds of compatibility issues. The DVDs themselves could get scratched and damaged, making mini DVDs a very fragile long time storage format. I will doubtless do a YouTube video on all the fun of extracting digital data from various DVD formats at a later date. In the meantime, I hope you've learned something from this video. Please remember to share, like and especially subscribe. Then I'll make more videos in the future about audio and video technology. Bye for now.